So my title of my message this morning is, There is Poison in the Pot. And we're going to be reading out of 2 Kings chapter 4, verses uh, 38 through 41. Now this is an Old Testament passage of scripture. Just real quick, give you a little bit of context so that you know. I didn't really have like a big PowerPoint graphic to tell you, but let me just tell you a little bit about the history of the world that we live in according to what the Bible says. So according to the history of the Bible and where we are in the world, that we live in, and you didn't learn this kind of stuff in your history class when you went to school because they don't put the Bible as a history book uh, in in schools. But what the Bible says is that God had always had a plan. God had a plan to create a people that would desire to serve him. And so on this earth that we live on, there's really two groups of people. We're not, the world and society would have us believe that we're separated by culture, by race, by skin color, by languages. And there is some level of truth to that. But but reality, according to the Bible, is there's only two kinds of people. There's people that know the Lord, love the Lord, and serve the Lord. And then there's people that don't. That's really the two kinds, according to the Bible, that's because everybody, God doesn't see skin color. God doesn't see skin color. He doesn't see culture. God can understand his uh, Espanol. He can comprehend Espanol just as well as he understands English. So, so th- none of that really is, is what separates for God. So there's, so there's believers and there's non-believers. Well, let me just tell you, the history of the Bible tells a long story of God getting us to the place where you and I are today. There's a whole biblical history behind us that God has been working to get us to where we are today. You and I live in the midst of a society where we take for granted the fact that Jesus has already come and he died on the cross and he resurrected from the grave and now he's ascended to the Father. We just take all that for granted. Some of us know it, some of us don't. But, but what I want you to know is that the Bible tells, ha, tells a story. That, that, there was, that God created man and he put him in the garden and man fell. And now the offspring of man is full of sin. But God had a plan before man ever sinned that he would send his son to die on the cross. And so the way that he did that was, is that, see, there was a time when there was no nation called Israel. Now you can see there's a nation called Israel on the news. But, but before that time, God called a man named Abraham before there was a nation. And he promised that he was going to make a nation out of him. And through that man, he created the entire nation of Israel in the Old Testament. And through Israel, he gave the world Jesus. Through the prophets in in the Old Testament and the kings in the time of Israel, God, through the prophets, would use them as a mouthpiece to prepare his people to understand that he was going to send the Messiah. And that's in the Greek, that word is Christ, which means the anointed one. God was going to send the anointed one who was the answer to the problems that man faced. And so when we look at 2 Kings, we're in the second chapter of Kings. This is the, these two books tell us the story of the time frame of Israel after, after they had left Egypt. Y'all heard the story of the Red Sea before. After they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and after they entered into the promised land. And now they've been having kings. They've already been through King Saul, King David, uh, you know, and Solomon even. And, and during the time frame of the kings, God would send prophets. Then he would have prophets, which was a mouthpiece to speak the truth of God and the things of God so that the people of God would be able to know the ways of God so that they could follow after God. But, it, but just as it is in the world today, many times God's people venture off course and they go their own way. And this, the, the, this is the, well, the sad thing, is, it's just true, is that, that we do, if God is real, there's an enemy to God. And, and he's very powerful, and he's very wise, and he's very subtle, and he's slick, and he's got tricks, okay? And he knows how to deceive people. And he knows how to paint things in such a way that it looks like, sometimes it's so good, it's such a good masquerade that it looks like it would be God, and it's really not. And, and even in the Old Testament, God's people, after a period of time, they would become deceived and they would even think that they were serving God when in reality they weren't really serving God anymore, okay? And the enemy is always trying to put something in the mix to cause confusion. And so that's where we are. We're in a time frame of Israel's history where, you know, not even all of Israel is serving God. Many of them have fallen prey to false gods and false worship, okay? And so, so let's read this little story right here. It says, And Elisha, 
came again to Gilgal, and there was a dearth in the land. The word dearth is an old King James word that means famine. And the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said unto his servant, set on the great pot. What does that mean? Put a pot on the fire. And seethe or cook pottage. We could say pottage. We could say stew. For the sons of the prophets. And one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine. And gathered thereof wild gourds, his lap full. He got a lap full of wild gourds. And he came and he shredded them or he cut them up and he put them in the pot of stew. For they knew them not. Other versions say he knew them not. In other words, he didn't really know exactly what they were. I want you to, I want you to understand that. Okay, So they poured out for the men to eat. And it came to pass as they were eating of the pottage that they cried out and said, Oh, thou man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat thereof. But he said, Then bring meal. Now what is meal? That's another way to say flour or grain. Okay, And he cast it into the pot and he said, Pour out for the people that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. So that's really the idea behind my message this morning. There, there's poison in the pot. You know, just real quick, whenever I, I like to cook, I, haven't, I don't have too much time to cook anymore. I like to experiment. I kind of cook like this dude a little bit. I usually start off with some pretty natural ingredients like some olive oil or butter, throw a little onion and garlic in there, you know, and kind of get that simmering. And then I start looking around, what would look good in here? What would go good in here? I'm just picking from different things. And I don't really cook by recipe. I just start grabbing stuff and sticking it in the pot. Now, I'm not going to go try to look for no wild gourd, okay? But you get the point, you know, just trying to mix different ingredients, Right, And, you know, I would say that God's kind of like cooking a little gumbo like that, too. And what I mean by that is this, is that God's got a little pot on the simmer. because, And he's putting different ingredients in there. And what I'm trying to talk about is in Revelation 5, the Bible says that they stand before the Lamb. And they're from every tongue and tribe and nation across the earth. And they're giving glory and honor to God. And so in a certain sense, you could say... God's cooking up a big old stew, amen? He's a, a big old stew of individual, uh, individuals from various aspects of the world and that ultimately th that we're going to end up in a place where we serve him and that our whole life's work on earth will have determined whether or not we were servants of the Lord, amen? But you know, I, 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 talking about the God's family, it's a little bit different when you compare a natural family uh, to a spiritual. Because, you know, in the natural, you can't really choose your family. You know, you're born into the family that you're born into. But your spiritual family is a whole different scenario. Like, you have to choose to be in the spiritual family. God, if, you know, the, the way the story of God works is that he created us with a free will, and he's giving us the ability to be able to choose to serve him. And just as literal family members look like their parents in some way, right? I can't always see it, but most people are like, man, you look just like your daddy. I'm like, mm, I don't know. I think you look like your mama, but, but they look like both. Just as literal children look like their, the image of their parents many times, the Bible says that God created us in his image and likeness. And so he's looking for his family to look like him in some ways, as a matter of fact, in the New Testament, the Bible teaches us that, you know, we're not supposed to be conformed into the image of the world. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, don't be conformed to the world. What does that word conformed mean? It means to be molded and you end up looking like them. What does the world look like to you? I mean, there's a, there's a lot of different ways we could describe that, you know, and I, I mean, I could spend the rest of the morning doing that, but I just need you to understand that you may not, uh, you, while you may not understand everything I say this morning, I really hope you do understand that one of the biggest things I'm trying to say this morning, and I say it a lot, so if you don't catch it today, you, if you come back next week, you'll probably hear it again, is that there's a big difference between what's going on in the world and what's supposed to be going on in the church. Now, when I use the word church, I use that term to describe the people of God. I'm not talking about a particular denomination. I'm not talking about a particular religion. I'm really talking about the people, people that are born again in Jesus Christ. 
Well, what, what are you talking about? Well, let's go ahead and get that out the way real quick. In order for a man to be born again, he must first understand that he's a sinner. You don't need to understand all the things I'm about to say, but you need to understand that you're not right. Many times you don't even know what it is that isn't right or what it is that's missing in your life. You just believe something's missing. And you know that all of the things that you've tried to put into the pot to fix it have not fixed it at this point in time. It just seems like something's still missing. And the thing that it's missing is the Lord. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ. It's missing. That's a missing piece in your heart and in your life. And you have to understand that's what the Bible says. The Bible says that's the missing piece is Jesus. And, and whenever you hear that, and if it rings true in your heart and you accept it by faith, the Bible teaches that you become born again, that you receive Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross as for yourself. In other words, Jesus has already died for everybody that's ever lived on the earth, amen, but, but only those that choose with their free will and say yes to Jesus are those that are truly born again from the dead. And when you get born again, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. So I want you to understand that, and the main thing that I want you to know is that when I say the difference between the world and the church, that's really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the difference between the world that is not really living for the Lord and the church, those people that have become born again and are, by the grace of God, separating themselves from the world. By the grace of God, separating themselves from the world. It doesn't happen overnight, my friend. Walking with God and understanding the things of God takes time. Amen. Walking with God and serving God, it's a process of time. We first start off, we don't know a whole lot, but if we hang around for a while, we're going to learn some things. Amen. So I just wanted you to, I wanted you to see that. And we're supposed to, we're, so we're not supposed to be conformed into the image of the world, but instead Romans 8, 29 says that we should be conformed into the image of his dear son. So the longer we walk with God, the more we're supposed to look like Jesus. In the way that we act, in the things that we say, and the things that we do. Amen. And how are we going to look more like Jesus? How are we going to know what Jesus does that's different? It's because we're going to begin to understand the word of God better. Amen. All right. So in, in the Bible, you know, throughout, throughout the word of God, there's a common theme that runs through the Bible about vines. I want you to know that. I, I don't even have all of the scriptures here that I could, that I could use to exhaust this this topic, because if I used them all, we would never get out of here. But I need you to know that, and we're going to use some of them, because I want to show you the picture that I'm trying to say, that, that within the whole of God's Word, through the Old Testament and then all the way into the New Testament, the Bible repeatedly uses the illustration of a vine. Sometimes the vine is wild, and that represents things having to do with the world, and sometimes the vine is planted by the Lord, and that represents the people of God. And so this repeated theme is intended, again, ultimately, that the vine that belongs to God is that God's hope is that it's going to bring forth fruit. Amen? I've said that many times before, but God's desire is that there's going to be a harvest on the earth. I mean, listen, if God is real, then we need to know what he's up to. And what God is up to is, is that he desires to have an eternal family that will live with him. Amen? Uh, and so, so what does it take to be part of God's eternal family? I mean, is it, is it because we were born into a certain family that said they were Christians? Is it because we were born into a certain denomination or a certain religion? Or is it because we've been born again? I got to tell you, it's because the Bible teaches it's because we've been born again. So sadly, though, there are also multiple references in the Bible that describe God's vine morphing or transitioning into a wild vine. In these instances, it's, it's usually the surrounding environment that's affecting them. It begins to change the nature of the vine. Just like certain types of soil might affect the flavor or size of a grape or a gourd, so God's people are affected by the environment where they are growing. Does that make sense? I mean, if you can imagine... If you could imagine, this is just one little simple illustration. You know, you take two different children, and listen, this isn't going to work perfectly, but I'm just trying to make a point. You would expect that the child that was raised in a 
loving environment that, was, that they were protected and they had the things that they needed would, would grow up and be more st- in a more stable environment and therefore their adulthood would be more stable than a child that, was, that grew up in an unstable environment. But the truth be told, that doesn't always work because sometimes children that grow up in unstable environments are like, dude, I don't want to be like that. And by the grace of God, they're able to, to do better and vice versa. Other children are raised in a stable environment and they, they, don't take, they just take it for granted and they just do whatever they want and they open up doors in their life and you got a big old mess. But for the most part, you see what I'm saying, and I'm trying to talk about the environment, that the environment around us and where we place ourselves, it can affect our life. It begins to influence the decisions that we make. It begins to, and, and this can go in so many di- different directions. I hate to be the kind of preacher that has to just fill in the whole list of blanks, but as I've learned, and I understand that we really need to depend on the Holy Spirit to let the blanks be filled in for yourself. But at the same time, I think that sometimes we miss some things, and so, so maybe we need to throw some of this kind of stuff out there. Sometimes the, rela- the relationships, that we're, they can cha- really change our environment. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the friendships that we have. Or the closeness of, you know, like if we're of a young age and we're dating somebody or the, or the person that we choose to be our spouse or whatever the case. These things can affect our environment pretty significantly. If we, if, we, if we constantly put ourselves in the presence of another person that does not really want to serve the Lord and, and instead they're allowing the, the world around them to, to transition their behavior into something worldly, the, there's a good likelihood that it's going to affect us. You know, you, you listen, I know, you, I know people don't like when I start talking about music and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to beat it up too bad, but I just want to make the point that that's, when I say, when I talk about music, it's because I'm looking for things that are in the world. You know, it's kind of funny. I was at the, I was at the hospital Friday and I, one of the nurse practitioner ladies that I work with, she, she was like, well, you need to look up, da, da, da. So I opened up my phone and when I looked at my phone, I had up there this Harry Styles song. I don't even know who Harry Styles is, my friend. I'm just going to tell you right now. She said, oh, Harry Styles. I'm like, well, hold on a second. Let me just tell you this story. I was looking. I said I wanted to know what the number one song in America was right now. And I don't even remember the name of the song, but it's a song by Harry Styles. And so I read the lyrics to it because I was trying to make a point. The world has its own communication. So I, she said, I love Harry Styles. I'm like, well, hold on a second before you get too excited. Let me just tell you what, what the whole plan was on this. I wanted to see what the lyrics say because the world has its own communication. And again, I don't remember what the song, the title of the song, but I look, read the lyrics and there was one spot and he's sitting on the floor. Things aren't as they were and something about taking some pills and whatever. And I know that the world twists everything up. And he's like, yeah, but he was talking about probably whenever things were going rough and that that's how he used to deal with things. But he don't want to do that no more because it leaves you empty. So then the next step is, so that, that's what I'm trying to say. You understand that the communication of the world says there's some things out there that are hurting. There ain't no telling why this old boy is sitting on the floor wanting to talk about, sing about taking pills. Maybe he had a bad breakup or something. I don't know. Y'all might know the song. I don't know really know the song, but whatever it was, got him on the floor, and even if he's not doing that now, that's what he used to do, and even if it's what he doesn't want to do now, what is he going to do in order to get past that? See, and that's the next step, because see, the world even has communication for that. Now, this is usually when I go to stepping on people's toes. Because the world will tell you that if you've had a problem with substances in the past, that now the answer is AA or NA. We'll, we'll preach or why you want to beat that up because they got people that go to church that go to AA and NA. Listen to me. I've had to go to AA before. I've been involved in AA. I've been involved in a lot of things. But let me just tell you something. It's, a, it's not the same communication. And listen, it's, it's shrouded because they say that, that we have determined that it, we needed something, a, a, a power higher than ourselves. And they call that God. Well, you don't really want me to get into it too much. Do you ever notice how they got that pyramid on the front of their book? That's a whole other story. Let's not get into that. But what I will tell you is this, is that that God is not talking about the same God that I serve. 
It's not. As a matter of fact, if you start saying the name of Jesus too much in AA, they will get perturbed. I promise you, things are going to start shaking and jittering up in the atmosphere because it's okay to use any old God that you want, but they can't help themselves because if you say Jesus enough times in AA, there's another spirit behind that organization, and it is not going to want to share its glory with the Lord of glory. I can promise you that. People don't understand exactly what I'm trying to say but because they would say, but isn't it good if people get help? Absolutely, it's good. If you can get off the sauce, get off the sauce. But hopefully, and look, I've been on the sauce, so I can talk about it if I want to. But hopefully, once you get off the sauce and your head gets right and you become more sober-minded, then you can be introduced to the real Jesus, hallelujah, and he can come on the inside of your heart because look... Let me just leave you with this. I'm talking about communication of the world. I'm talking about a wild vine versus a cultivated vine. I'm talking about the things of God versus the things of the world. I'm talking about the people of God versus the people of the world. I'm trying to tell you that there's two kinds of people that are existing on the earth today. And I got to tell you that in AA, and I know I say this a lot, but this is what they say. Introduce yourself, sir. My name's Matt, and this is who I'm always going to be. I'm always going to be this guy that just struggles because it's inherently in my genetics. It's in my DNA. I, I received this unsavory DNA from my daddy named Jim, and he was an alcoholic, so I'm going to be an alcoholic, and I'm going to die an alcoholic, and the only hope that I have is that I just keep coming back over here and getting these chips. And, you know, and I mean, I know it seems like I'm making fun, but I'm trying to make a point. I don't want to make fun of nobody. I'm trying to make a point. That's not what the Word of God says about me. The Word of God says I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that God does a creative miracle on the inside of the person. And he changes them on the inside. And listen, and this really gets people mad. But guess what? I ain't shrinking back. I ain't trying to get nobody mad. I'm not trying to poke nobody in the eye. I'm not trying to step on nobody's toe. I'm just trying to tell the truth. And you can't start mixing psychology with theology. You can't start mixing the ways of the world with the ways of the church. You can't say, oh, let's add recovery to the word of God because it's two diametrically opposed systems. And now you're trying to amalgamate them. Now you ain't doing nothing different than what the enemy's done which is to speak partial truths in the midst of lies and just enough truth to draw someone in and then they're, and then they're just stuck in a system that will never truly set them free. I'm here to tell you this morning, whether you feel freedom or not, whether you've been coming to church for five years and you still don't feel freedom, that don't mean that it doesn't work, my friend, and that what you and I are supposed to do is to hold on to the Lord and to keep trusting that God will change the inside of our hearts. And in our lives. I'm trying to make a point. I hope you're following with me that there's two systems on the earth. There's a wild vine. There's a cultivated vine. The cultivated vine is the people of God. The wild vine is the people of the world and the ways of the world. And the world has a message. And it's everywhere. I know I shared a little bit about this maybe Wednesday night, but there was a PA student that I was working with at the hospital. And I started trying to talk to her about some of these things. A little bit about psychology and some of the things I talked to y'all about, about how the word in the Greek for soul is psyche, and that's where we spell the word P-S-Y-C-H-E, where we get psychology from in the Greek. That's where we get that word, and it means soul. And so the soul of man is made up of his mind and his will and his emotions. I mean, I could get so deep on this psychology thing. I could tell you some things that you, you ain't ready for it yet, so I'm just not going to do it. But, but what I will tell you is this. I told that young lady, and look, I had her all, all flustered for a second because she was like, she was ready. To, she was tough, man. She was like, she was ready to, she was ready to throw down a little bit. And I could tell that, it was, that, the, that the tension was getting heavy. And, and, you know, I just kept trying to stay calm. And then all of a sudden, dude, the Lord showed up, and it was like opened her eyes. And she didn't completely agree with me when we were done, but she said, I understand what you're saying now. I, she was so flustered, though, because she could not believe that here I was, a person that had taken all these psychology classes, a person who had studied science, and that I was saying that the answer for mental illness wasn't psychology and medications that psychologists 
prescribed. I said, I said, and then when, this is what I had to say. I said, listen to me. You misunderstand what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that the soul belongs to God. That's his business. And that if a person really wants to be healed, I'm not trying to say that somebody, even a believer, won't be on medications for a period of time. That's not what I'm trying to say. But what I am trying to say is, is that this place right here belongs to God. And God wants to heal that person. And anybody in this room this morning that has served God for any length of time and has been on any kind of medication like that knows what I'm saying is true. Amen. God wants, but I just need you to know that. God wants to heal you and make you whole. He wants to make the chemistry in your brain right so that you don't have to be dependent upon that. But so in her mind, she just was all thrown off. And I'm like, no, you're misunderstanding me. There's some people that are never, ever going to turn to the Lord. And, they, and I believe in giving them whatever help they can get. We don't want people, we want, right? We don't want society falling completely apart. That's not what I'm trying to say. But what I am, because some of these people are never going to come to the Lord. And they're never going to learn to trust it. And it's sad. It is. I believe that that's part of the proverb in chapter 31. Whenever Lemuel, which is another name for Solomon's mama, told him, he said, give strong drink to him who is perishing. He ain't got no more hope left. So just numb his pain a little bit as he slips into eternity. Because there's going to be people that are, and then when I finally <laughs> kept saying it, I think she finally understood what I was trying to say. She said, I understand what you're saying now, but it's so abstract, meaning God wants to heal your heart. He wants to heal your mind, and your mind is influenced by your emotions. This really doesn't have a whole lot to do with my message other than I'm trying to say that the world has an answer, but you need to understand something. And I'm not trying to tell you about something that I don't know nothing about because I know a little bit about this. The science of psychology is trying to fix the mental health of people without God. Don't tell me that I'm not telling you the truth. Because you, when's the last time you sat down with a psychologist that really and truly wanted to include God into the equ equation? I know they got Christian counselors out there. But again, they're mixing psychology with the things of God. Amen? All right, so what I'm just trying to tell you is, is that I, what am I telling you? If you happen to be in this church this morning and you love God and you're serving God and you're still on mental health medication, you know what I'm saying? Take you, if, if the Lord hasn't shown you to stop your medicine, don't stop your medicine. Because I'm not here to go around judging people and telling them because the Lord knows that my life ain't perfect. But, but look, whenever the, but when the Lord starts to lead and guide you, and I believe he will, because he wants to set you free from these things, when he begins to lead and guide you down that path, listen, there might be some rough times, but if you'll hold on to the Lord and trust him, he will be the medicine that you need, and he will bring healing to your heart and to your mind. I believe that. Because again, well, what's the difference? And that's what everybody wants to go back to. What's the difference between that and physical medicine? Because the psyche, the suke, the soul is God's business. That belongs to him. The mind, the will, the emotions, all of this environment that we talked about and being in this environment and all of the things from this external world that has started to try to affect us and shape us, it begins to have its way and it begins to affect us. God wants to heal that. I hope you can believe that with me this morning. Amen. Plus the fact that a lot of times these medications like throw your thinking off. That's why, that's why so many times, so many times people got to be on, um, tried multiple different types of medications. Amen. I know that's spending a lot of time on this, huh? All right, let's keep moving. It's, it's the world's way of, I'm, the main point I'm trying to make is, it's the world's answer to try to fix the mind, the will, and the emotions of people. And all I'm trying to say to God's people this morning is, is that we have other answers. We have the Lord to heal us, amen, the answer, to heal us and to touch us, amen. So that, you know, and, and there's also the truth that there's a wild nature to every human heart that wants to kind of go its own way and seek after its own plan. But usually when the people of God turn into a wild vine, it's because they're looking for something other than God to remedy their current problem. These two passages out of Jeremiah that we're about to go to, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse uh, 13, 
Jeremiah 2, verse 13. I kind of, I think that these two passages kind of show this. I, I, I like that. I always love this scripture right here. Whenever I first started reading the Bible, it really touched me. He, th- this is the Lord speaking to his people, Israel. And so look, I know I've shared this with the, with the church a lot, but whenever we're talking about the Bible and we talk about the Old Testament, the thing that we have in common between Old Testament people and New Testament people is that if you're a Christian today, guess what? We're all the people of God. We're just at two different, test- two different testaments or covenants, if that makes sense. In the Old Testament, they were still God's people, and in the New Testament, we're God's people. So what he says is, my people have committed two evils. Well, what did they do, Jeremiah? Number one, they, for- they have forsaken me, the fountain of living water. And number two, they have hewed out for themselves cisterns broken cisterns that can hold no water. So the two evils, what, what is Jeremiah trying to say? He say, God is saying through the prophet Jeremiah, I provide, I, it, whenever they, my people come to me, you know what? It's like I'm a spring of living water. Have you ever swam in a spring before? It's a beautiful thing. It's cold. You feel the water bubbling up. It's fresh. It's coming from the earth. It's fresh. It's clean. It's clear, right? Versus, he said, they forsook me who's, who's providing living water for them and can, can nourish them and provide every need that they have. And instead, they chose to dig a, a cistern for themselves. Now, back in the Israel, cisterns were made out, they were made out of rock. They'd quarry down into the rock. And he said, but it wasn't just a cistern. It was a broken cistern. So it couldn't even hold any water. And, and part, of what, part of what his people were doing is, and what he's talking about right here, is they were trusting in the help of other nations. They were trusting in other nations like Egypt or Assyria. Uh, these nations that worship false gods and they were making alliances with these countries and they were saying, hey, we need some help fighting. We need you to help us. Instead of trusting in God to do something supernatural for them, they were making evil alliances. But this is really the one that I wanted you to see right here in the same chapter, verse 21. He's talking about Israel and he's talking about the fact that they're looking towards others for help. And he says, yet I had planted you. This is what God's saying to Israel, his people. I had planted you a noble or a good vine, holy and a right seed. How then are you turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? So I'm trying to, based on our story, he went out and he grabbed the wild vine and he put that inside the gumbo pot and it caused all kind of trouble. And what I'm trying to tell you is that there's a theme that runs throughout the scriptures where wild vine describes something that is not of the Lord and it sometimes describes God's people going in a wrong direction. Israel belonged to God, yet she wanted something other than God's plan. She was always wanting what the other nations that surrounded her had. Eventually, that would result in her wanting their gods. You know, we got to stop right there, and I know I do this every now and then, but when we look at the Old Testament and the fact that Israel worshiped false gods and went after false gods, what would a false god be in your life today? Or what could a false god be in my life today? I think that's important that we would understand that. Some people say, oh, well, you know, I see these people, they got statues in their yard and various things like that. I mean, that's one aspect of it, but it's a lot deeper than that. A God in your life will be, can be anything that stands between you and God. If you're looking at something in your life, if you're trusting in something in your life, whether it's to bring you, to help you escape from the pain of life, to help you whatever, whatever, and you feel as though you have to have that thing in your life and that that's what's going to fix your problem, and without that thing right there, you can't go on. You're taking glory away from God, my friend. I can't make it without this thing in my life. And yet at the same time, you're putting hope and trust in that instead of putting hope and trust in the Lord. Again, there's sometimes there's seasons in our life whenever we're having a little bit of more than one thing going on and we're learning to trust more in God and trust less in that other thing. As long as we're moving closer to the Lord, that's what God wants from us. So I want to encourage you with that. We're all in the process of getting rid of gods in our life and putting our hope and our trust and our focus on the Lord. Amen. So she, so she would turn to these gods, whatever, and whatever these things are, if it's something, you know the easiest way to figure out a god in your life is whenever you don't want to get rid of it. You know it's not helping you and you don't want to get rid of it. No one, no man, don't mess with this, dude. I don't want to hold on to this thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
So I wanted you to see that. Look, let's look at another scripture real quick in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. This is what the Lord says. Here's another about a vineyard or a vine. Look what the Lord says. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard. Now the vineyard would be Israel, okay? Or the vineyard would be the people of God. My well-beloved has a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. He fenced it, and he gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine, and he built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press there. And you see what's going on. He's, he's preparing the, the earth. He's preparing the environment to have, a, to have a harvest. I mean, he's even built the wine press already. He's expecting to get some fruit out of this deal and to get a harvest. Right? And he said, and he looked that it, he was expecting it to bring forth grapes. And look what it did. It brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. This is what the Lord would say. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. So in the story, essentially, what God is saying is, is that I planted you, Israel, as my own people. I, you're the, I made you the choicest vine of all the nations. I prepared your property and the environment so that I was expecting to get a harvest out of you. And what turned around was is that you went after false gods. We can connect all of this. And you turned yourself into the wrong kind of vine. And you're bringing forth the wrong kind of fruit. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tear down the hedge and I'm going to tear down the wall. And I'm going to let this vineyard be eaten up. Now, what I want to tell you is this. Is that many times in our life, the decisions that we make when we venture outside of God's will, we will see discipline in our lives. I don't know if the right way to see it is punishment. I don't... You know, I guess you could call it punishment. If you want, a parent punishes their child just like a parent disciplines their child. If you want to use the word punishment to describe discipline, yes, God disciplines his children. And many times we don't understand why things are happening in our lives the way they are. And what I want you to know, though, is that God loves you enough and he loves me enough that he will allow the hedge of protection to be pulled down for a moment to get our head right, to begin to bring healing in the midst of our lives, to turn that vine from a wild vine into a cultivated vine where it won't produce wild grape, but instead it will produce grapes from God. So in order for a vine, though, to remain the planting of the Lord, it must stay where it's planted. Let me say that again. In order for a vine to produce the kind of crop God wants it to produce, it must stay where God planted it. Well, what you trying to say, preacher? We need to stay in your church. That's not what I'm trying to say. That's what some preachers, that's how some preachers preach it. I've heard many a preacher preach it that way. If you ain't ever heard it preached like that, then you just ain't been in church long enough. There is some truth to staying in a church and not getting up and moving around all over the place, right? But at the same time, maybe that person that's getting up and moving around all over the place is just looking for the truth, and they ain't found it yet. Amen? What, what really is describing here is that you and I would stay planted in the place of truth, that we would stay planted in Christ, that we would stay planted in the faith, that we would not waver and go away from the faith of, of, in Jesus Christ. Now, some people equate that to church attendance. And church attendance is a part of serving God, okay? But I'm just trying to say, you can be a servant of the Lord, and you have to find a new church because maybe you moved to another town. But the question is, are you staying in the Lord? Are you staying in Christ? Are you staying in the faith? Or are you venturing outside of the faith and falling back into the ways of the world? That's the difference between the two. So in order for a person to be fruitful and healthy, they're going to have to stay where they were planted because if you choose to move yourself, then guess what happens? Then we're refusing to allow the husbandman, which is another name for the vine dresser, to begin to correct us or prune us, to care for us, and to mold us. I don't really have time to turn there, but I got it in my nose. John chapter 5, 15. In John chapter 15, Jesus said this. He said, I am the vine, you're the branch. He who abides in me will bear much fruit. 
He also goes on to say, I'm paraphrasing, if you abide in me, guess what? If you're not bearing fruit in that area, guess what? you know what my father does? He prunes it. He prunes branches on the vine that aren't producing fruit. Because sometimes those extra branches are just taking the life away. There you go. go good fruit doesn't grow on old branches. So sometimes you just got to get rid of those branches so that the fruit of the Lord can be produced. God wants you and I to know that sometimes when we're enduring the pruning of the Lord, it doesn't always feel good. Lord, no, I know I've experienced times before where the Lord's trying to teach me things and show me things that are in my life that need to go, things that need to be pruned, things that need to be taken away, and it doesn't feel good. But guess what? If, you're not, if, you're gonna, if you and I are going to go from being a wild vine to a good vine, from producing wild fruit to good fruit, we're going to have to stay in the faith, and we're going to have to endure as God begins to trim away at these things to make us, amen, the right <coughs> kind of vine. Now, I didn't even put it in here, but in Revelation 14, there's also a scripture that talks about the vine of the earth. And it talks about, it talks about two types of, it talks about the clusters of the earth, and it's describing the fruit, and, and God, and God, harvest that and I believe that's talking about the rapture but there's no question that the second vine is the vine of the earth and he harvests that and he puts it in the wine press of the wrath of God so in the end this degenerate vine this earthly vine this wild vine is going to be going to be judged God is going to judge the offspring of the world of the world of the earth that has refused to give their heart and life to him that's why it's so important that believers like yourself, we might be small in number, but if we're true believers and we have the Holy Spirit living in us and we're learning and we're becoming disciples, we're supposed to live our lives for the Lord in public, amen, the way that God would do it in your own little personality. He's going to do it different in each and every one of us, but to share the hope of glory with others that are out there that need the life of God, amen. I want to just kind of share with you a couple of things out of this passage that we read that I think might be able to help us. The first thing is, I want to talk to you about dearth or famine. You know, the Bible's filled with situations and circumstances that talk about famine. If, you, if you've ever read the whole Bible, you can see where the theme of famine is repeated over and again. Famines cause people to move from one direction to another. If, if God wants his people in a certain place to, for a certain purpose, he'll just cause a famine in the land, and he'll force people to begin to move in a certain direction. You know, one of the things that I was thinking when I was thinking about famine is that famine kind of creates a little bit of an appetite, right? It starts off, it's probably not that bad. It just kind of starts off where it kind of, creates a little bit of an appetite in you, you know, whenever a famine starts, maybe in some of us, we just might start thinking, man, I, I need to start feeding on the Lord more, I need to, I need to start, start trusting in God more, right, but then some, but, but if the famine remains, guess what, the appetite turns into desperation, if we start getting desperate, right, and many times we'll start looking for other things to, to put into the pot, Right, and, but, but I want you to know that God promises to supply our needs according to his riches and glory. God promises to supply our needs. So why in the midst of the famine? Because listen, you can have a physical famine where you're hungry and your belly's growling. But you can also have a spiritual famine where you feel like you're dead and dry on the inside. And so why in those times, whenever we find ourselves in the midst of a famine, do we begin to uh, not be able to trust God anymore? When we know that God can supply all our needs. Many times it's because we allow our wants to supersede his will. We allow our, what we want to supersede what God's will is for our life. Don't you know that it's so true that many times we have our own desires in our heart and, and many times we think that just because it makes us feel good or just because something showed up you know, out of nowhere and that was what we were looking for that we automatically think that that was God's answer for it. But in reality, can I just warn you about something? The devil can stick something in your path too. 
You over here praying for something and then pop the next day, there it is. Like, I mean, I'm just saying, let's just use this. Single woman as an example. She's in the church and she's praying. I, I'm not picking on single women. I'm just trying to say. She's like, Lord, I need a good man. Send me a good man. Next day, there you go. You run into this dude. Oh, there it is. Answer to my prayer. You better hang out and get to know this old joker first. You better get to know this dude for a little bit before you come on now. Don't be jumping up in, into all that stuff, into that relationship too fast. Because if you become unequally yoked with an unbeliever, now you're connected to some. And I mean, look, they send you scriptures all day long. Oh, yeah, baby, you love Jesus? Okay, look, pop, let me send you this. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yeah, see, we got a little connection here, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. That's just one example. There's all kinds of examples like that. We'd be praying for something, and all of a sudden, bam, oh, look, the Lord. Lord, you, you showed up so fast on this one. Man, look, sometimes the test got to come first, the Lord's, uh, the, and the Lord's allowing the enemy to stick something up in the pot to see if you're going to nibble on it, see if you're going to bite on it, see how it, and because God wants you and I to be able to trust him and not just to jump in. God wants you and I to start to be able to learn the difference between the things of God and the things of the world. I hope that makes sense. And that actually brings me to my second thing, is the wild vine, all right? Because, look, it says, is, is, is the world and sometimes God's people, so what is the wild vine? It's the world. And sometimes God's people start acting like the world, right? I, I mean, I, I hope you can see that. If you've been in the church for any length of time, if you've visited other churches, I've been, the, problem, the problem I have is, or the luxury I have is that I'm getting old, and I've been around a little while. I got saved when I was 19. I'm 55 now. Now, dude, that's, I mean, I may not be really, really old, but I'm just saying, I got a little bit of time in this thing. What is that, 36 years? Something like that. 36 years I've been saved. I got saved in a little bitty church in Berwick, Louisiana. I've been to a lot of different churches. I've seen a lot of different things. And all I'm trying to tell you is that the church has changed. In the big church, in the main, in the thing we call the church, the message has changed. It's so it's changed multiple times, actually. It's changed multiple times, and it's not the same thing as what's always written in the Word of God. So I want you to understand that the wild vine, and, and, and that's what that man went and did. There was a famine in the land. He went and he found a wild vine, and he stuck it in the pot. And i got to tell you that sometimes God's people are putting wild vine in the pot. Sometimes God's people are starting to embrace the things of the world. Like sometimes whenever we see the, the new way that church services are going, and I'm not here to, to judge people, but listen, the church is not about an entertainment show. It, it's not supposed to be about an entertainment show. And if, and if we're making our services more like an entertainment atmosphere because we're wanting to draw the people in the world that want to be entertained, then we're not really functioning the way that we're supposed to because God's house is supposed to be a place where his believers or where people that end up wanting to become believers come to the house of God. Hopefully they'll get born again and saved and then they'll continue to come and they'll grow in the things of God and they'll grow in their understanding of God and then they'll reproduce after their own kind and they won't be reproducing wild vines but instead they'll be re reproducing the cultivation of the Lord. And, you know, one of the things that I would encourage you is this, is that you might invite people to church, and sometimes they may show up, and they might come once, twice. They might stay forever. But then again, they might only stay three times. But you know, don't get frustrated. You did your part. And, and, and you know, I'm going to do my best to do my part, and we're always asking the Holy Spirit to do his part. But the person also has their part. They have a free will, and they have to be willing to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And if they'll do that, and they may not even come back the following week, but guess what? Six months down the road, they might come back. And y'all have seen these kinds of things before. So we're not going to change the way the Word of God says church is supposed to be done just to buy into what the world is doing to make it look more relevant because the world's doing things a certain way. They dim the lights. They put smoke machines. They got some strobe lights. And they got groovy this, groovy that, you know, and all this kind of stuff. No, we're not here to try to make the world happy. We're here to make the Lord happy. Amen. So, so that was the second thing. There was a famine in the land, then there was a wild vine. But look, this is the next thing I wanted to ask. What are you putting in your pot? And, and, and what I mean by that is this, is that 
I went back and I looked at this pretty close. If you'll, if you'll remember in the story, it said he did not know what, the, what it was. Do y'all remember that part? I kind of wanted to draw y'all's attention to that. He didn't really know what it was, that wild vine. He just said, oh, look, this would be good in the gumbo. Let's grab this. And so he picks up the vine, and he cuts up them gourds, and he sticks it inside of the pot, and it's cooking. You know, one of the things that I wanted to share with you on this is that sometimes even the people of God, because this is a son of the prophets, meaning he's, supposed to, he's a prophet of God. There's a lot that can be said about that. Because, look, sometimes the people of God, we don't always hear the voice of God as clearly as what we would like to. Now, if you talk to the wrong kind of person, they'll be like, well, I don't know what kind of preacher you're listening to that's going to tell you that you don't always hear the voice of God. Because, you know, because the Bible says that you don't hear the voice of a stranger. Let me tell you something. If you've been serving God for any length of time, there have been times in your walk with the Lord that you felt like you were hearing from the voice of God, and you moved in a certain direction, and then afterwards you realized that you had missed God. The enemy wants to beat you up for that, but I'm here to tell you right here, right now, amen, that sometimes that happens even in the hearts and lives of believers, but it's important that you do know what you're putting in your pot, because some of the things that we put in our pot are poison. And whenever we put the world and the things of the world and the instruction of the world and the communication of the world inside of our pot, it produces a poison in there, and it can cause a lot of trouble, right? So I got to tell you that, but listen, the more, you, the more you learn from God, the more you learn about God, and the more you continue to come to church and study the Bible for yourselves and pray and seek God, you will begin to be able to tell the difference. Right now, I gotta remind you that this is a prophet of God. That that's that that that's not that just picked up the wild vine and stuck it in there. He didn't even know this stuff was poison. Right. But that brings me to my next my next thought, though, real quick. The unction of God. There's a scripture in First John. It's First John two twenty, and it says, "You have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all truth." That word unction in the Greek is really charisma, which is where we get the word charisma. The word charisma means to be smeared with oil, and it talks about an anointing. So what it's saying is, is that when you got saved, the Holy Spirit came to live on the inside of your heart, and now through the Holy Spirit, you have an anointing in you that helps lead you and guide you in truth. So while that prophet missed it and stuck the wild gourd in the stew, at some point in time, them old boys knew they was eating poison. <laughs> they had an unction. Now, I don't really know what it looked like. For all I know, them boys could have got diaphoretic and started sweating all over the place. That's just a fancy word for sweating. Yeah, diaphoretic, and they might have been, I'm not trying to be gross, they might have started vomiting all over the place. Who knows, they might have ran a fast fever. I don't know. Oh, they might have been moaning and groaning and holding their belly. There's poison in the pot, man of God. What are we going to do? Or maybe it was just the taste of it. I don't know. And they're like, man, this isn't good. But whatever it was, the point that I'm trying to make is, is this, is that sometimes you and I may not know right away that we're grabbing a hold of a wild vine or something of the world and we're sticking it in our pot. But if we're saved, guess what? At some point in time, the Holy Spirit is beginning to reveal to us and allow that unction in us to show us the difference between the truth and a lie. The question is, will we listen to the voice of God? Because, see, if I go back to that God thing, I'm like, yeah, but I love it. I love it. I don't want to let go of it. I don't want to hold on to it. I don't want to surrender. I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to keep this wild vine. I just, just, I just get nauseated in the morning, and then I'm better in the afternoon. It's not that bad. No. Lord, give us the grace that we need to, when we get that unction, that we would, that we would release it. Lord, we need you to fix the pot, amen? We need you to, to heal the poison that's in the pot. And that brings me to my last kind of concept on this anyway, is this, is that God has a cure for the poison in the pot. I want you to know that, right? And in the story, what do they do? They put flour in the pot, right? I told you all that. <laughs> I want you to know that the Bible said in the King James Version, they put meal in the pot, but that's another King, old King James word to describe flour, and I want you to know that there's, there's topics in the Bible that talk about flour, all right? And that in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, I'm going to do this kind of quick. We're not going to turn there. But in Leviticus chapter 1, 
It talks about two offerings. It's the first offerings that are mentioned. It's the whole burnt offering and the meal or grain offering. Okay, I want you to get this picture in your mind. I want you to understand that in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, these offerings, these animal sacrifices were typology or paintings of a picture that were showing that Jesus was going to be the ultimate sacrifice that would come. So the first two offerings that are spoken of is, number one, the whole burnt offering, right? And then number two, the grain offering. In the whole burnt offering, it was supposed to be a male bullock, okay? And it was supposed to be without blemish. So that means that the, that the high priest or the priest that was working had to uh, inspect the animal, and make sure that it had no blemish. So it couldn't have any obvious missing fur. It couldn't have any scars on his body. But not only that, they had to cut the thing open and they had to inspect the entrails uh, and make sure it didn't have any tumors. No tum- It couldn't have two kidneys. If it had two kidneys on the inside or an extra lobe on its liver or, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to be weird. Well, let me, I don't even have to use that word. But, so, but, but any of that stuff, you go, okay, we'll throw that one out, man. He's got a blemish. So bring me another one. Let's start over from scratch. Dude, that would be an arduous process. What if you had to go through four before you, you know, before you got, you just happened to grab four siblings and all of them got from their daddy that they only had one kidney. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, okay, can you go, go find some other farmer's animal for me? And so finally you get to the point where you find one that's without blemish. And look, they cut it out. They'd inspect it. They'd wash the entrails. They'd skin it. They, they wouldn't even really skin it. I think they burnt the whole thing because that's why it was called the whole burnt offering. They'd clean up the, the, the extremities and they'd stack it up on on the, on the altar where they were going to burn it. They'd put the, the extremities, they'd put the torso, they'd put the entrails, all the innards, and the fat. And that was a big part of it. The fat belonged to the Lord. Okay, and, and, and we don't have time to get into the depth of all of that, but, but this is the point. And then they would ignite it, and the Bible says that it would become a sweet aroma to God, like a sweet-smelling savor to the Lord. Do you ever smell a good barbecue? Amen. I brought Sierra and them to eat at uh, Texas Day Brazil last night. Boy, and they come over there with that flank steak. They got that fat seared on there. Ooh, baby, I know why the Lord liked it. But anyway, that's another story (laughs) for another time. Anyway, the point being is this, is that the whole burnt offering represented the fact that Jesus gave his whole life for us. And it represents the fact that he was without blemish and he was without sin. And that's why he was able to pay the sacrifice. And so now he's given his whole self for us and God wants us to give ourself back to him. Every time they offered up a whole burnt offering, I'm going to get into the grain now, they would also offer up a grain offering. Now, the grain offering was made of fine flour. Now, what that means is, what does is, what is fine flour to you mean in your head, if you had to guess it? Just imagine yourself as an ancient Israelite living way back in the gap. And, and, you're, and listen, think about it. You ain't, going to, you ain't going to Kanata's to go get your fine flour, your bleached flour. They don't work that way. You, 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 have, you might be going to the market if you don't have your own field, and you might be buying some whole grain. But in order to get fine flour, you got to do some stuff to it. Right? And what you're going to have to do. I don't know how they did it. They probably, they probably crushed it up with some big old rocks to some extent. But then even once you get the flour, even after they did the initial process of it, it's still got some grinding that needs to take place. They probably had some big old mortar and pestles, and they were probably in there. And what they were trying to do, they were trying to separate the chaff from the grain and grain, grind down the flour. And it probably didn't look anything like our bleach flour nowadays. But the point is, is that the more they would grind it, that's what they're talking about when they get to fine flour. Now, what I need you to understand is this, is that, listen, the chaff in the New Testament represents the impurity. The fine flour and the fact that the chaff or the impurities was removed goes back to, again, Jesus' sinlessness. And so this offering, a portion of this flour along with oil and frankincense would be burned on the altar along with the whole burnt offering. It was the memorial portion that would go before the Lord, and it was a sweet savor unto the Lord also. And then the rest of it, the priest would eat it. And so what I need you to know is, is that whenever they put meal into the pot, I'm telling you, I believe that that is a type of Jesus Christ and what he was going to do when he offered himself as a sacrifice. And so what I'm telling you is I'm not trying to make something up for you because in the New Testament, I know this to be true. The New Testament says that in Adam, in the fall of man, there is poison in the pot. 
And there's a whole lot of things out there in the world that are trying to poison us against God. And the enemy is trying to get us to put it inside of the stew. But I got good news. If you would be willing to put Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross inside your situation, inside your life, that God would begin to heal and he would begin to make whole. Does it happen overnight? Some things happen overnight, but for the most part, it's the, the, there's a beginning and there's a process, amen, that takes place. I just want to close, uh, singers, musicians, y'all can come forward. I want to close with just a couple of scriptures right here because, see, we're talking, about, we're talking about separating out the world from the people of God. And how this is done, if the, if the whole burnt offering and the grain offering represent Jesus Christ and him crucified... These are some scriptures in the New Testament that talk about that. Some people would say, but there's things in the world that I'm having a hard time letting go of. I'm going to try to tell you real quick where to keep your faith and where to put your faith. The Bible says, the Apostle Paul said this, God forbid that I should glory. In other words, if I'm going to give glory to anything, this is what I'm going to give glory to. I'm going to give glory to the, in the cross of our Lord Jesus, by whom the world is crucified to me, and I am crucified to the world. In other words, when I put faith in Christ, the Lord begins to cause those things in me that are trying to make me look like a wild vine to begin to die. Amen. I hope that makes sense. The next scripture is this. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Now, I did a little bit with this scripture because, look, we, believe, we use this scripture a lot. So y'all just bear with me. I got a little animation here. What does the word preaching mean in the Greek? That's the word in the Greek, logos. And you know what it means? It means word. The simple version of the word. So it could, you could say, for the word of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But you could also the, say the teaching of the cross. You could also say the message of the cross. So it's really the idea of what is behind the cross. Again, it's not this piece of wood right here. It's what Jesus accomplished when he died on the cross spiritually, when he overwhelmed and triumphed over the works of darkness. It's what when you put your faith in it and you put your hope in it, it's like you're putting Jesus into the, the poisoned pot. And God now is beginning to heal and to make whole. And he's beginning to change amen the last thing I want you to know is this if any man be in Christ he's a new creature all things are passed away behold all things have become new listen I don't know what you're going through this morning I don't know what you're facing but I, I just want you to know the altars are always open if you've never they're about to sing us a song and we're going to go out of the house of God worshiping but look the altars are always open if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior I, I didn't ask if you've ever been to church before. I'm, I'm wanting to know if you've ever accepted Jesus into your heart. If you've never prayed a prayer where you said, Lord, please come into my heart and forgive me of my sins. I believe you died on the cross and that you rose again. You can pray that prayer right now. And if you mean business with God, listen, you watch it on video, whoever you may be. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can invite him into your heart right now. You can say, come into my heart, Lord. I want to put the flower inside of the pot. I want healing from this poison. I want you to heal me from this wild vine that I received in my first birth. Jesus, come into my heart and forgive me of my sins, Lord. Forgive me of my sins and teach me your ways, oh Lord God. I want to give my heart and my life to you, amen.